The title of this lecture is Three Saints of Early Medieval Britain. While Julius Caesar had led military expeditions to Britain in 54 BC, the island was invaded by the Romans and made a province of the empire in 43 AD. With this annexation, annexation came Roman cultural institutions. One of these was Christianity. We do not know exactly when Christianity was introduced in Britain. One popular legend maintains that Joseph of Arimathea, an early follower of Jesus, brought the faith to Britain in 63 AD. The story maintains that the Christ child guided Joseph through the land, through the island. This is without historical foundation, of course, but it is beautifully expressed in a poem by William Blake titled, And Did Those Feet in Ancient Time? Tertullian mentions Britain in one of his polemical works. He describes the haunts of the Britons, inaccessible to the Romans, but subjugated to Christ. Now the term subjugated does not mean, of course, that Christianity predominated in a third century pagan Roman province. Tertullian is using hyperbole to make a point here. Nevertheless, this is clear evidence of the church having a presence in Britain by the late second century AD. To gain a sense of the life of the church in early medieval Britain, we will briefly examine the lives of three saints. Saint Alban, who died somewhere between 209 and 305 AD, Saint Augustine of Canterbury, who died in 604 AD, and Saint Cuthbert, who lived between 634 and 687. Our first saint, Saint Alban, lived in late Roman Britain. He is referred to as the proto-martyr of Britain, being the first British Christian we know of to die for the faith. The date of his martyrdom, however, is uncertain. According to Bede, the most eminent of medieval English scholars, who recounts Alban's martyrdom in his ecclesiastical history of the English people, Alban was martyred in the year 305 under the intense religious persecution of Diocletian. Modern scholars, however, propose earlier dates either 209 under the, under, the, under the Emperor Septimius Severus, or between 251 and 259 under either Decius or Valerian. We don't know much about Alban's life. We know that he was originally a pagan. During the persecution, however, he hid a priest from an unnamed Roman ruler. Bede tells us that Alban was so impressed by the priest that he converted to Christianity. Bede writes, When Alban saw this man occupied day and night in continual vigils and prayers, divine grace suddenly shone upon him, and he learned to imitate his guest's faith and devotion. Instructed little by little by his teaching about salvation, Alban forsook the darkness of idolatry and became a wholehearted Christian. When it was discovered that Alban had hit the priest, he was arrested and brought before the Roman magistrate. Bede tells us that the judge was standing before the devil's altars offering sacrifices to them. He ordered Alban to offer sacrifice. Alban refused, saying, He who has offered sacrifices to these images will receive eternal punishment in hell as his reward. Alban was then taken away to be killed. Bede then recounts a story that is reminiscent of the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and the River Jordan to enter the Promised Land. Bede tells us that while Alban was being taken to be executed, a river blocked his passage to the spot of his execution. The river then miraculously dried up, making a way for Alban to proceed to his martyrdom. Bede writes, Thereupon the riverbed dried up at that very spot, and he saw the rivers give way and provide a path for him to walk in. So curiously, the site of Alban's martyrdom is for Alban a promised land. Now upon seeing this, the courage of, and the courage of Alban, the executioner himself converted to Christianity. The executioner was then beheaded, followed by Alban. Then, Bede tells us, the persecution, at least in Britain, ceased. He writes, Then the judge, who was astonished by these strange heavenly miracles, ordered the persecution to cease and began to respect the way in which the saints met their death though he had once believed he could thereby make them forsake their devotion to the Christian faith. 
With the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity in the 4th century, the church became firmly established in Roman Britain. However, the safety and security of the Britons, situated, situated as they were on the outremmer of the empire, was tenuous. They were repeatedly raided by the Irish and the Picts. The Picts were the inhabitants of what is today Scotland. As the stability of the Roman Empire deteriorated, the Romans evacuated Britain in the early 5th century. At the same time, Irish and Pictish attacks became more frequent. Thus, in their desperation, the Britons elicited help from the pagan Angles and Saxons across the sea. Thus, the Angles and the Saxons settled in eastern Britain. It did not take long for the Anglo-Saxons to realize how weak the Britons were. Thus, they saw an even greater opportunity, conquest. They turned on the Britons and conquered most of what, is be, what had been Roman Britain, establishing several petty kingdoms in what is today England. In this slide, we see the various routes taken by the Anglo-Saxon invaders who settled and conquered Britain. They're coming from as far north as what is today Denmark and as far south what is near the German border today. In this slide, we see the various small kingdoms the Anglo-Saxons established over most of Britain. These Anglo-Saxon kingdoms came to constitute what we today call England, that is, the land of the Angles. But the several kingdoms at the time were Northumbria in the north, Mercia in the center, Wessex and Kent in the south, and East Anglia in the east. Now again, the Anglo-Saxons were pagans. Thus, with their conquest of Britain, paganism was reestablished. The Britons, for their part, however, did not evangelize the Anglo-Saxons. Bede castigates them for this, writing, To other unspeakable crimes was added this crime, that they, the Britons, never preached the faith to the Saxons or the Angles, Angles who inhabited Britain with them. Nevertheless, God in his goodness did not reject the people whom he foreknew, but he had appointed much worthier heralds of the truth to bring his people to faith. We learn the story of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons in the story of Augustine of Canterbury, which is recounted by, again, the historian Bede. Augustine of Canterbury, not to be confused with Augustine of Hippo, the church father, was a monk in St. Andrew's Monastery in Rome, a community founded by the man who became Pope Gregory the Great. Augustine was sent to England by Pope Gregory to evangelize the Anglo-Saxons. B discusses Augustine's mission in detail. Augustine traveled to England with an entourage of 30 monks. While passing through Gaul, he was consecrated bishop in 597. That same year, he landed in the southeastern kingdom of Kent in England. Now, the kingdom of Kent was ruled by one Ethelbert, a pagan. Ethelbert's wife, Bertha, however, was a Christian from the Frankish royal family. Bede tells us that Ethelbert had received her from her parents on the condition that she should be allowed to practice her faith and religion unhindered. Ethelbert gave Augustine and his companions an old Roman church dedicated to St. Martin in the city of Canterbury, to which they added a monastery. He also gave them freedom to preach in his kingdom. Augustine and his monks won many converts, and eventually, in approximately the year 600, Ethelbert himself converted. He was the first Anglo-Saxon king to accept Christianity. Augustine's correspondence with Pope Gregory reveals the missionary strategy he implemented, a strategy which was actually that of Pope Gregory himself. Augustine asked, asked Gregory what to do with the pagan shrines of the Anglo-Saxons after they and their rulers had converted. Should they be destroyed? Gregory told him not to destroy the pagan temples, but to convert them to churches. Gregory writes, When the people see that their shrines are not destroyed, they will be able to, aban to banish error from their hearts and be more ready to come to places they are familiar with, but now recognizing and worshiping the true God. Thus it was through such prudent and practical measures that one by one the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms embraced Christianity and their peoples were gradually led to abandon paganism.
Finally, we come to St. Cuthbert. Cuthbert was born around 634 in Northumbria, the northernmost Anglo-Saxon kingdom. As a young man, he was a nominal Christian until he experienced a call to the monastic life. He entered a monastery and later became a hermit and finally was appointed Bishop of Lindisfarne in Northumbria. His life is narrated in Bede's Vita Cuthberti, or Life of Cuthbert. Cuthbert began his monastic life in the monastery at Melrose. Here he distinguished himself by his asceticism. The modern Catholic dictionary defines asceticism as spiritual effort or exercise in the pursuit of virtue. Examples of asceticism include fasting, long periods of prayer, and denying oneself basic bodily comforts. These type of practices were typical of the monastic life. Bede describes Cuthbert's ascetical practices when he writes, Once admitted, Cuthbert was careful to keep up with the rest and observing the rule. He excelled them in zeal for strict discipline. He watched, prayed, worked, and read harder than anyone else. Like Samson the Nazarite, he carefully abstained from all alcoholic drink, but he was not so severe with himself as regards food, lest his work should suffer. He was robust and strong, fit enough to carry out everything he chose to put his hand to. One of the things that characterizes monastic asceticism in particular is prayer. As an ascetical sacrifice, we see prayer in the practice of the monastic vigil. This practice centered on the night office, which, cons which consisted of psalms and prayers chanted at Compline. Compline consisted of prayers at the close of the day. And resumed and concluded by lauds, that is, morning prayer. When a monk kept vigil, he would stay up all night between Compline and lauds, chanting the psalms. Cuthbert often maintained vigil through the night. Bede writes, He was in the habit of rising in the dead of night while everyone else was sleeping, to go out and pray, returning just in time for morning prayers. Later, Cuthbert moved to the monastery at Lindisfarne, where he became prior. While here, he undertook pastoral ministry for the surrounding countryside. Here we see something similar to the situation in Ireland during the time of St. Patrick, a monastic community assuming responsibility for the pastoral care of the people in the region. Bede tells us that Cuthbert continued his custom of frequent visits to the common people in the neighborhood in order to rouse them up to seek and to merit the rewards of heaven. He became famous for miracles, for his prayers restored sufferers from all kinds of disease and affliction. He cured some who were vexed by unclean spirits, not only by laying on of hands, exhorting and exercising, that is, by actual contact, but even from afar, merely by praying or predicting their cure. Eventually, Cuthbert sensed a calling to live the life of individual solitude, that is, the life of a hermit. He left the Abbey of Lindisfarne and relocated to the remote island of Farne, where he undertook the hermetic life. It was there that Cuthbert waged intense spiritual warfare. Bede writes, The island was haunted by devils. Cuthbert was the first man brave enough to live there alone. At the entry of our soldier of Christ, armed with the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the devil fled and all of his allies with him. Cuthbert prevailed in the fight with the devil. After driving out the demons, Cuthbert's presence bestowed a new character on the island. Bede writes, This soldier of Christ, as soon as he had become monarch of the land he had entered and overcome the army of the usurpers, built a city fitted for his rule, and in it houses equally suited to the city. Notice Bede's use of the term kivitas, or city. By city, Bede does not mean a literal town or city. Interestingly, he uses the term to signify the hermit cell of Cuthbert. Even though it is an individual dwelling, it is, in a spiritual sense, a city. In this city, the saint is monarcha, which translates as absolute ruler. Bede contrasts this role with tyrannus, which most properly means tyrant or despot, an oppressive, illegitimate ruler, which of course the demons were. This is the army of the usurpers to which he refers. By his use of concepts such as kivitas and monarcha, Bede presents Cuthbert as the ruler of a new spiritual city. 
So while the terminology is different, we have here, I think, an allusion to the idea of a Christian commonwealth that we encountered with Augustine of Hippo. Cuthbert's presence on the island has established a new city, as it were, one characterized by holiness. Soon, Cuthbert was called upon to assume the duties of a bishop. He was appointed bishop of Lindisfarne, and here he retained his monastic charism in his pastoral ministry. Like many saints before him, he was an example of the monk bishop, one who was trained in monastic discipline and nevertheless retains this discipline even after undertaking formal pastoral duties. Bede writes, Gladly and diligently, he practiced his wonted frugality and, amid the thronging crowds, rejoiced to preserve the rigors of monastic life. He gave food to the hungry, clothing to the suffering, and he was duly adorned with all else that should mark the life of a bishop. And the signs and miracles whereby he shunned outwardly gave witness to the inward virtues of his mind. Thus it was that the virtues Cuthbert acquired as a monk and hermit were put to the benefit of larger Christian society. So in conclusion, what do we see in the examples of these three saints from early medieval Britain? We see that these three together parallel the three saints of late antiquity we encountered in the previous lecture, representing three different aspects of emerging Christendom, but contained within Britain. St. Alban personifies the confrontation between the church and paganism, resulting in Britain's first martyr. St. Augustine of Canterbury represents the encounter between the church and paganism, but this time in the form of a very successful missionary enterprise that results in the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons and the eventual establishment of Christian England. Finally, St. Cuthbert personifies the further pastoral consolidation of the church in Anglo-Saxon England through the spiritual and pastoral efforts of a monk bishop. This pattern of confrontation, mission, and consolidation is the pattern of the church at large and now exhibited on a smaller, insular scale in Britain.